Number one gives us a graph of P that represents the insect population W weeks after it was first measured. The population is growing exponentially. What is the weekly factor of growth for the insect population? So in this one, um, to find the growth factor, right, you take the new measurement divided by the original measurement. So we're going to do the 8100 divided by the 900, which gives us 9. But this is um, not just one factor or one interval, because we see that this is when we're going from 1 to 3. So if we were to look at this in, in a table, you know, we'd have 1, 900 here, then you'd have 2 something, and then you'd have 3, 80, 100. And um, we'd have 0, the initial value here. So this is, if we had the growth factor, we would be multiplying by the growth factor to get to the second one, and then multiplying by B again to get to this third one. So this is actually our growth factor squared. This is B times B. So in order to figure out the growth factor, okay, or what this B would be instead of two Bs, is we would want a square root. So then we end up with that the growth factor is three for the weekly growth factor instead of two weeks. And then it says, what was the population when it was first measured? So now we actually want this um, initial value, right? So we want to go from the 900 back to this. So going backwards would be dividing by your growth factor. So we're going to take the 900 and we're going to divide by the one week growth factor of three. And that puts us at 300 for that initial population. And we know if we actually plugged 300 in here, right, then we could multiply by 3 and we'd get 900. We could multiply by 3 and get 2,700. Multiply by 3 and get to that 8,100 so that we know that all of these things are working out correctly. Then we want to write the equation relating P to W. So P is the population in based on the number of weeks is equal to that initial value and then times the growth factor to the power of the number of weeks. And we know that that growth factor was three. Number two, here's the graph of a function defined um, by a times b to the x power. Select all the possible values of b. So when we look here, we see that B is decreasing, right? So we see that this is decaying. That means that B is going to have to be less than 1. And so if we take a look, well, B can't be 0. Otherwise, this would just be a flat line at 0. Um, 1 tenth would be fine. That's a decay function. 1 half would be fine. That's going to be decaying. 9 tenths would be fine. 1 would not, 1.3 would not, because that's higher than 1, so this would be growth. And 18 divided by 5 is greater than 1, so that would be growth as well. So that would not work. So B, C, and D. Number 3, the function F is given by this, 50 times 1 half to the X, and G is given by 50 times 1 third to the X. Here are the graphs of both functions. Kieran says that since 3 is greater than 2, the graph of G lies above. So he's saying that G is this upper graph. Um, so G lies above the graph of F. So graph 1 is G and graph 2 is F. Do you, ex do you agree? And then explain. Um, but So 3 and 2 are not the growth factors, right? It's actually 1 half and 1 third. So since 3 is greater than 2, that means that 1 is being split up into more parts in 1 third than it is in 1 half. That actually makes 1 third less than 1 half, right? And if you wanted to divide it in your calculator, you could see that 1 third is 0.3 repeating and 1 half is 0.5. 
So one third is actually less than 0.5. So one third is um, going to be below the one half in this case. So this is gonna be graph two. Number four, the function f is defined by 50 times 3 to the x, and g is defined by a times b to the x. Here are the graphs of f and g. So we know, and let me just draw on this one. So here's that f graph. And so we know that this one is 50 times 3 to the x. So then it's saying, what do we know about a in the g graph? Okay, so here's the G graph, and we see that A is above the graph of F. And so A in the F graph is 50. So if G is above that, then we know that A has to be greater than 50 for it to be above. Then it's talking about B, the growth factor. So what do we know about B? So B in F is 3, and we see that F is growing more quickly than G since it crosses it. So G started above it, but then F crosses it. So this one has a, a bigger growth factor than G does. So that means that in the G function, B is going to have to be less than 3. We also know that in any exponential growth equation, um, if it's growing, it has to be greater than 1. So we know that B is somewhere between 1 and 3. Number 5, the equation 600,000 times 1.055 to the T represents the population of a country T decades after the year 2000. Use graphing technology to graph the equation then set the graphing window so you can simultaneously, so at the same time, see points on the graph representing the population predicted by the model in 1980 and in the year 2020. So what's your graphing window? So before I pull this graph over, if we just think about this, if 2000 equals the year zero in this model, right? So 2,000 is represented by t equals zero. Um, then we want 1980, right? And we're talking decades. So this is an important thing. So we're talking decades. So 1990 is one decade before 2,000. So that would be negative one. So 1980 is 20 years or two decades before 2,000. So we need to go at least down to negative two. And then we need to get to 2020. And 2020 is two decades after or 20 years after 2000. So that's going to be T equals two. Um, and then our output starts at 600,000. So our Y values are starting at 600,000 and they're growing. So you can choose to isolate down onto that 600,000 and go like 600,000 to a million and then go like negative three to three. Um, I chose, I like to see it from zero. So I actually chose um, to do my Y scale from zero to a million. So mine um, for my X's or my T's in this case, I did negative three was less than T and then went all the way up to three for T, just so that I could really see the negative two and the two in my window. And then for the, um, what do we call this function? Okay, just Y. So then for the Y, I chose to do zero was, actually I chose to do negative 10,000 so that I could see a little below the axis there. So I did negative 10,000. Um, is less than y is less than and then i went up to a million just so i could see it um again you could have zoned in closer i wouldn't go to six hundred thousand because you need to go a little bit below that when you go backwards um but you can see if you did a window of like 
four hundred to eight hundred thousand, you'd have been able to see it as well for those Y values. Number six, the dollar value of a car is a function F of the number of years T since the car was purchased. The function is defined by the equation F of T equals 12,000 times three fourths to the T power. How much was the car worth when it was purchased? So we can see that initial value here of 12,000. You can also um, plug in T equals zero if you forget that this represents the initial value. What is F of two? So then we're gonna to wanna to plug two in for T. And when you do that, you get 6,750. And that represents the value of the car two years after purchase. Part C says to sketch a graph. So if we just want to sketch a graph, um, we know that the initial value here is 12,000. And then if I cut that in half, there's 6,000. And then if I go one, two, three, four, we know that after two years, it was at like 6,700. So we know there's a dot here, or there's a, you know, the initial value is 12,000. Two years, it was around 6,700. So you could just, you know, kind of do your sketch like that. So if you're drawing a sketch, that's good enough. Um, but then part D actually asks us to figure out when the car's about 6,000. And so I chose to actually graph this. So to actually get a graph of the function so that I could see that. And so then I, I graphed the function and then I also graphed the line y equals 6,000 so that I could figure out where they intersect and find out that um, the car is worth $6,000 after about 2.4 years. Number seven. A ball was dropped from a height of 150 centimeters. The rebound factor of the ball is 0.8. How high in centimeters did the ball go after the third bounce? So we've got the initial height and the growth factor. So we can write an equation of 150 times 0.8, and then the number of bounces will be your exponent. So in this case, that's three. And when we plug that into our calculator, we get 76.8, which would mean about 77. Number eight, a triathlon runner um, or a, a tri triathlon athlete runs at an average of 8.2 miles per hour. So runs at 8.2 miles per hour, um, swims at an average of 2.4 miles per hour, and then bikes at a rate of 16.1 miles per hour. At the end of one training session, um, she has swam and biked more than 20 miles, okay? So more than 20 miles. Is it possible that she swam and biked for the following amount of times in that session? And remember right here, it says she didn't run. So all she did here was swam and then biked. And does it get her the correct amount of miles? Because remember, she has to go more than 20 miles. And so the way that you figure this out is by doing distance equals rate times time. So we're going to take the rate that she was swimming at, which is 2.4 miles per hour times the amount of time that she was doing that activity at. So 2.4 miles per hour for a half hour. Then we're gonna add on her um, biking. And so the biking rate is 16.1 miles per hour. And she did that for one hour and 25 minutes. So when we, um, calculate this. So 2.4 times 0.5 gives us 1.2 miles of swimming. 
And then she also did um, 20.125 miles of swimming, or sorry, of biking. And this gives her a total of 21.325 miles, which is greater than 20. So this session would work. The next session, she swam again at 2.4 miles per hour for one third of an hour. And then she biked again at 16.1 miles per hour for 70 minutes. Now be careful, you need to turn this into hours. So this is 70 minutes divided by 60 minutes. Okay, so how many minutes she did divided by the number of minutes in an hour. And so if we calculate these, she ended up swimming for 0.8 miles plus she biked for 18.78 miles, which gives her a total training mileage of 19.58, which is not greater than 20. So this would not work out for that session. Then it says write an inequality to represent the relationship between the time she swam and biked in hours and the total distance she traveled. Be sure to specify what each variable represents. So we've got her swimming time, right? And so we can see based on the way we wrote this that this is the variable because it's varying, it's changing. So her rate stays the same and this is times her hours, um, whoops, swimming. So I'm just gonna call this S. So 2.4 times S, and then over here I'll write S is hours swam. And then we're going to add on the biking amount. And so again, we can see that this inner part is the varying amount. So her rate stays the same at 16.1 times the number of hours she bikes. So I'm just going to call that B. And then we need this to be greater than 20 because that would equal out to the miles. So then we need that to be more than 20. And then it asks us to use our inequality to graph the solution set. So if she only um, swam, so if, if we had no biking, she would need to do 2.4 S would need to be more than 20. So I'm just gonna set this equal to 20. Then I'm gonna divide by 2.4. So if she only swam, she would need to swim for 8.3 hours in order to get 20 miles in. So that's gonna be our horizontal intercept, 8.3. Then if she only biked, Okay, so if she didn't swim, we could figure out how long she would need to bike for by plugging zero in for S. So then we get 16.1 um, miles per biking to equal out to 20. We can divide by 16.1. So she would need to bike for 1.24 hours in order to get 20 miles. So here's one, so 1.24 would be about right there that will give us our line. Now, our miles cannot be equal to 20, right? So we need to have a dotted line for this because it can't be equal to that boundary. Anything on this line would mean she did exactly 20 miles and she needs to do more than that. So she needs to do anything above, any solution sets above this line and that would get her the 20 miles in of swimming and biking.